One, two, check. One, two, check. Amen. I really enjoyed those songs. And once again, that shows that we serve the right God. Because like I said, three years ago, I didn't see a church. But now I see a church and a choir. Amen. Amen. So all we have to do, sisters and brothers, is keep the commandments, serve the Lord, and have patience. And he'll take care of the business. Amen. So before we do anything, sisters and brothers, as we always do, we want to start with the reading of the law. So my beloved brother, if we can go to Exodus chapter 20, we want to read verses 1 through 17. Exodus 20, 1 through 17. Whenever you get it, Brother Donnie, go ahead and read. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Amen. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughters, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Amen, sister and brother. So we just read the law, the Ten Commandments that the Lord himself gave in person to Moses. Let's get a second witness of these commandments to see if they are in effect to this very day. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and we want to read 13 and 14. We read the lawgiver. Now let's read what the wisest man, King Solomon, said about the commandments. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. Whenever you get it, brother, go ahead and read. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Amen. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So, sisters and brothers, this is why we teach and keep the commandments, because all of us have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. One last place we want to go, Revelation chapter 22. The very last book in the Bible, the very last chapter. Let's see if the commandments are still in effect here. Because we read from the Old Testament... And some people inaccurately think that the Old Testament is done away with. So let's see if we can read these commandments in the New Testament. Again, Revelation 22, verses 14 and 15. Whenever you get it, brother, go ahead and read. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Amen. For without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So sister and brothers, we read the law every lesson to show that the Lord's commandments are still in effect even until this very day. So we want to go ahead and get started. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is Brother Tony P. I'll be your teacher today and reading for us is our beloved Brother Donnie. And the title of today's lesson, sister and brothers, is called The Bible versus Egyptology. Was the Bible copied from the Egyptian Book of the Dead? Once again, the Bible versus Egyptology. Was the Bible copied from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And sisters and brothers, the reason why we decided to do this lesson today is because the so-called black man in America has not been taught his true history. And as a result of this, many of our people will gravitate towards religions and cultures that we think will reflect our nationality and our history. So a brother who's searching for his identity, he might start to read a few books here and there, and then once he does that, one of the first things he wants to do is turn around and disregard the Bible altogether. Because according to some people, this Bible has nothing to do with the so-called black man's history and nationality. So in that case, what they will do is they'll choose to either deal with Egyptology, Kemetic studies, Afrocentric studies, 
or even some of them might go the way of Islam, whether Orthodox Islam or the Nation of Islam or some other similar offshoot. So as a result, sisters and brothers are moving toward all these ideologies, many people will change their names, their diets, their clothes, their vocabulary, and their lifestyles in general. And when they do this, this is known as being conscious. And in fact, there's a whole movement today called the conscious community. Now, this community is composed of many different individuals with different beliefs, but they all got one thing in common. They'll tell you that this book, the Holy Bible, was written by the white man, for the white man, about the white man, and is used as a tool of the black man's oppression. They all say that same line. So what they would do, they'll turn around and teach that the black man or Negro are actually descendants of African people and we got to reclaim, we got to reclaim our African heritage because they beat that out of us during slavery. They'll even go as far to say that the Bible is not the original book, but it was plagiarized from the Egyptian book of the dead. But we're going to read it and see if that's the case. But sisters and brothers, the purpose of this lesson is to show that the so-called basic principles of the conscious community are in fact biblical principles. Now a lot of them reject the Bible because unfortunately a lot of preachers out here are wolves in sheep's clothing and they are not in the business of saving souls. They pervert the gospel and they don't teach what thus said the Lord. But nevertheless, if we actually sit down and read the Bible for ourselves, we will see that this holy Bible gives us our nationality, our history, our current conditions, and most importantly, our future as a people. And this future also includes the strangers, sisters and brothers, all the sons of Adam, because they won't be in the kingdom as some of our brothers teach as slaves and servants, but they can be fellow citizens in the commonwealth of Israel. So what we want to do is we want to see if this Bible actually plagiarized the Egyptian book of the dead, and we're going to look at some of these so-called conscious principles that actually originate in the pages of the Holy Bible. First thing I want to do is I want to have Brother Donnie read this article I just found this week. And I found this after I put this lesson together, which shows how the Lord works. This is from a website called Modern Ganya. And read what the title says, brother. The Bible is derived from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Jesus' story is the Bible. In the Bible is Zeus' story. So this is the article that we pulled up. It says the Bible is derived from the Egyptian Book of the Dead and that the story of Jesus is actually the story of Zeus. Go ahead and read that. This is an article that was uh, written back in May, excuse me, March 25th, 2022, and I just found it this past Thursday, and it ties into this lesson directly. Go ahead and read that article, brother, if you would. Leader of the Common Sense family, Avram Ben Moshe, has disclosed that the Bible has links to the history of Egypt. Go ahead. According to him, all the Psalms and books of the Bible were derived from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. So according to this guy, he says every psalm in the Bible was derived from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Now, he's, he's a leader of a, a movement called the Common Sense Family. Well, common sense ain't all that common, is it? <laughs> Go ahead, brother. In an interview with Reverend Nyansa Bokwa on Happy 98.9 FM's Nimsi Phi, Go ahead. he said, this, this why in everything, the Bible is so much connected to Egypt. Most of the stories in the Bible are from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. So again, he's reiterating that most of the stories in the Bible are from this so-called Egyptian Book of the Dead. Go ahead. He explained, Samson's story in the Bible is Hercules' story. So according to him, Samson in the Bible actually is Hercules. Go ahead. The story of Jesus is the story of Zeus. So Jesus is Zeus. Go ahead. Noah's story is also from the story of Gilgamesh, all from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Now, what is this brother smoking? He said wow. that Samson wow. is Hercules, Zeus is Jesus, Noah stole from the book of the story of Giglamish, and you can find all that in the Egyptian book of the dead. Hercules and Zeus are Greeks. That's that right. was written after this book. Yep. And he called himself the leader of the common sense family? Okay, I'm going to be nice today. <laughs> Go ahead, finish that. It is only a duplicate of stories from Egypt. And we should always remember that nobody was born a Christian, a Jew, or Muslim, he said. Go ahead, read that last part. It stated that everything we hear from the Bible is arranged because the truth of the matter is that God was invented by man. So he's saying that God didn't create man. 
but God was invented by man. Go ahead. And the whole concept of God and everything that has to do with us was all invented. The earlier we come to terms with this, the better for us all. And the sad part about this, sister and brothers, you got a lot of people out here that believe this madness. They believe that this Bible is not original and that it was copied from somebody else. But this dude couldn't even get the whole story straight because he put Zeus and Hercules in this book. Mm. And they Greeks that came 2,000 years later. I know. But if you ain't got no understanding, you're going to roll with that and you're going to go outside. You're going to tell somebody else that and you're going to show the world your ignorance, sister and brothers. So what we want to do is we want to read from both of these books to see if the Bible was copied. But before we do that, let's get into some scriptures. If we could, Brother Donnie, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I always like to start here because it's relevant even to this very day. And what did Apostle Paul tell Timothy? 2 Timothy chapter 2, my brother. And we want to pick this up at verse 15 and 16. And then we will skip. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 15 and 16, and then we will skip. He said, Samson is Hercules. I would not say that to nobody in public. <laughs> he gave a radio interview about that. No shame. <laughs> Second Timothy 2 and 15. Go ahead, brother. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. Go ahead, verse 16. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they, are, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And that's why we read that article to you all to show you an example of profane and vain babblings. And if you listen to madness like that, all it's going to do is increase unto more ungodliness. Go ahead, if you would, brother, skip down to verse 23. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes. So sometimes you got to just leave folks where they was at. If that brother would have told me that in person, I just would have told him to have a nice day. Like, all right, brother. Because sometimes you got to leave them where they at. Go ahead, verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. So we don't have to be out here debating and fighting each and every time, sister and brothers. It says the servant of the Lord must be gentle unto all men, not just Israel, but to all men, apt to teach and we got to be patient because a lot of these people haven't heard nothing but lies about the bible so we got to show them the bible if they're willing to receive it verse 25 and 26 in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves if god peradventure will give them repentance to the to the acknowledging of the truth amen go ahead and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will and that's the only reason we get up here, sisters and brothers, on this pulpit all over the world is to teach people what does say at the Lord because we're trying to save souls. We ain't trying to show everybody how smart we think we are. We ain't trying to win a whole bunch of debates. We just out here trying to save souls because the devil has deceived the whole world. And our job as priests of the Lord is to teach all the sons of Adam about salvation. Does that make sense? That's right. Amen. Let's continue, my beloved brother. Let's go now to 2 Peter chapter 1. Because you're going to hear a whole lot of fables and fairy tales and stories about the Bible from people who have never even picked up the Bible. You ask them to show you John 3.16, they're going to look at you like you speak in French. But you're going to tell me that the Bible is plagiarized or it came from somewhere else. But let's see what the book says about being an eyewitness. Second Peter chapter 1, my brother, we want to read verse 16. Then we're going to skip down to 19 through 21. 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to read 16, and then we'll skip down to 19 through 21. And when you get it, brother, go ahead and read. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, Amen. and we have made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So Peter is saying that we're not following fairy tales when we're dealing with the pages of the Holy Bible because they were there in person and they were eyewitnesses to the Lord Jesus Christ and his majesty. Verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. So he says we have a more sure word of prophecy. Go ahead. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, unto the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts. Because one of the main detractions that they will say is that the Bible was written by man. So how do you know that is the word of God? Well, let the Bible tell you that 20 and 21. Knowing this first, 
that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So there's no such thing as, well, that's your interpretation and this is my interpretation. No, it's about what thus said the Lord, whether we receive it or not. Go ahead, verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. So this right here proves that man did not write the Bible. He says the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Go ahead. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the holy men of the Lord were dictated what thus said the Lord, and all they did was wrote down what thus said the Lord, period, point blank. So man did not write the Bible. They just wrote down what the Lord told them to write. And a lot of people can't receive that because they have been deceived. And we know Satan has deceived the whole world. Let's take a look at it. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter now. And what we're doing, sisters and brothers, as always, is just building a couple of foundation scriptures, and then we will get into the meat of the lesson. But we want to give you all some tools out here when the devil sends out his servants to try to trick you and try to deceive you about the Holy Bible. We got some ammunition for him. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, because Peter said that we were eyewitness to Christ Jesus. So for all them brothers and sisters pushing this comedic doctrine, well, who's the eyewitness of Ra and Isis? Where are they at? Exactly. There was no eyewitnesses because those are false gods. And we don't say that to offend nobody. We just put truth on the table. So if Isis is God, is a goddess, or Ra or Horus is a true and living God, then whatever they say, you should be able to bag it up, right? But they didn't say anything. All you got from them is pictures on the wall and a couple of idols here and there. And we're going to see what happened to those things. But let's stay with the book right now. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And Brother Donnie, we just want to read verses 1 through 4. And whenever you get it, brother, go ahead and read. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Amen. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but, have, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And unfortunately, this is why too many people reject the word of the Lord, because you got too many false shepherds out here handling the word of God deceitfully. They won't even read the whole book to you, except maybe Malachi, bring all the tithes and offerings to the storehouse. So they see you got the pulpit pimps up here, and they see you got Pastor Porkchop. They ain't trying to hear nothing he got to say. And I'm with them on that. But don't throw away the whole Bible. Just throw away the person lying on it. Verse number three and four. But if, the, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. So if they can't receive the word of the Lord, it's because they are lost. And why are they lost? Verse number four. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. So if you were already teeter-tottering between the truth and falsehood, here comes Satan bringing a whole lot of lies with you, blinding you, so you won't even want to pick up the Bible, because they already poisoned your mind against it from the get-go. Go ahead. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Because again, Satan's job is to try to get everybody cut off with him, and he's taken away the tools of your salvation, which is the word of the Lord from Genesis to Revelation. And he'll put on a kente cloth. He'll put on a dashiki. He'll put on an Egyptian wrap and try to tell you that that's your heritage. And that has nothing to do with us, sister and brothers. And if you don't believe me, please go check out Black History is Told by the Prophets, what Brother Bowie did for the past five weeks, that proves that we are the children of Israel. But if you haven't seen it, we'll give you a quick recap momentarily. Let's go to Galatians, the first chapter now. We're going to stay with the writings of Paul just to get some foundations here before we go deep in. Galatians chapter 1. Because they say, well, the Bible, they enslaved us with the Bible, this, that, and whatever. But then when you ask them to prove it, because the book says prove all things, all they can give you is a bunch of sound bites and a bunch of regurgitated doctrine that somebody else told them. They ain't sat down and read this book. You ask them where Genesis is, they're going to be looking all the way in the back. So if you can't find Genesis, how are you going to tell me that the book is plagiarized? How are you going to tell me that it's not a true book and you haven't actually sat down and read it for yourself? But let's see why they haven't sat down and read it for themselves. Galatians 1, my brother, we just want to read verses 6 through 7. Galatians chapter 1, we want to read 6 through 7. And whenever you get it, go ahead and read. 
I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So there's another gospel out here, sisters and brothers. This is not the true and living gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of repentance. Unfortunately, in many of these so-called Sunday churches, you're getting the gospel of prosperity, a gospel of good life, a gospel of a, um, what they call it, a, um, a uh, specialized speech or a uh, feel-good message but you're not getting salvation or gospel of repentance. Go ahead, verse number seven. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And that's all we got right now, a bunch of wolves, a bunch of dogs in the pulpit, unfortunately giving you a perverted gospel. And because they give you a perverted gospel, people are throwing away the Bible altogether. So Satan is on his job, sisters and brothers. We have to be on our jobs. Let's hit Proverbs, the 18th chapter, real quick. We quoted it, but let's go ahead and read it. I've actually had conversations with people who have never even touched the book, telling me all about it and how, um, what they try to say. Well, you know, the Bible is contradictory. Okay, brother, where? Well, I don't know exactly where, but that's what I heard. Why did you even bring that out your mouth then? But that's what people do. And if you're not strong in your word, if you're not rooted in the gospel, you will fall for that madness. Because, again, Satan has his ministers out here to try to get us cut off. But let's see what uh, King Solomon said about this. Proverbs chapter 18, and we're going to read just one verse. Verse 13. Proverbs 18 and verse number 13. When you get it, brother, go ahead and read. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. So if you answer a matter before you even hearing it, the book says it's folly and shame on you. Because you got some folks that automatically hear the word Bible or church or whatever, and they got preconceived notions about what the Bible is or isn't, and they the first one to speak about it, and they the loudest ones to speak about it. You ever notice people are in error, are the loudest ones about their error? Mm-hmm. The Bible was plagiarized from this, that, and whatever. Okay, brother, what book was it plagiarized from? Well, you know, I saw this on the website. <laughs> or I saw a YouTube video. <laughs> and then when you correct them, then all of a sudden there's something wrong with you. You love the white man. I'm just reading the book. What you, got, what you talking about? But again, we've been so twisted. Anything that's the word of God and salvation, they would poisoned it. And we can blame, like I said, Pastor Porkchop and Reverend Pigmeat for that. <laughs> but the Lord is going to deal with these false shepherds. We ain't going to hit them too hard today. Let's hit Isaiah 46. Y'all all right today? Yeah. Praise God in Jesus' name. And I appreciate y'all for having me. I truly do. Isaiah chapter 46. And we're going to read verses 5 through 10. Because you got a whole lot of gods and goddesses out here. And if somebody really is thinking rationally, they might ask a good question. Well, Brother Tony, I see you reading from the Bible. I see this brother over here reading from the Quran, which the Muslims read from. I see another brother over here reading the books and the writings of Buddha. I see some people over here dealing with Egyptology and comedic sciences. How do I know that y'all worshiping the true and living God? How do I know that all of this is not phony like the brother in the first article said? Well, I'm glad y'all asked that question. The Bible answers it for us. Isaiah 46, and let's start this at verse 5, brother. Isaiah 46 and 5. And whenever you get it, go ahead and read. To whom will you liken me, and make me equal, and compare me, that we may be alike? So this is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob speaking. And he's asking Israel in particular, and the world in general, to whom will you liken me, who is equal unto me? He's going to show you how he's set apart from all these other gods and goddesses. Go ahead, verse 6. They lavish gold out of the bag, and weigh silver in the balance, and hire a goldsmith, and he maketh it a god. They fall down, yet yeah, they worship. So they make their own gods out of gold, silver, wood, and stone or whatever, and they fall down and they worship a god that they made with their own hands. So that separates the true and living God from all these other gods, because these gods are nothing but idols, false idols at that. Verse number seven. They bear him upon the shoulder. So he can't even walk from here to there. You got to carry him from here to there. Go ahead. And set him in his place. Don't let him fall on the floor. He's going to stay on there until you pick him back up. Go ahead. And he standeth. From his place shall he not remove. Go ahead. Yeah. 
one shall cry unto him, yet he cannot answer, nor save him out of his trouble. So they might draw ears on him, but he still can't hear. So you crying and praying to a false idol that can't hear you and he can't answer you. So this right here shows that we are dealing with the true and living God because he answers prayers, sisters and brothers. You pray to Ra, you pray to Isis, you pray to Buddha, you pray to Confucius, you pray to Allah, whoever else. They cannot answer you because they are nothing but idols, sisters and brothers. And again, this is not to offend anybody. This is to put truth on the table. Go ahead, verse number eight. Remember this and show yourselves men. Bring it again to mind, O ye transgressors. Now, God is about to show you his credentials, sisters and brothers, 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. So you got a lot of things out here that has that title of God, but he's saying, I am the true and living God. There is none else like me. There is no one else. And you know how he puts his credentials on the table? Verse number 10. Declaring the end from the beginning. So he tells you the end of the story way from the beginning. Go ahead. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. So in the ancient times, he tells you future prophecy. Go ahead. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So let's put everything on the table. If you say your God is a true and living God, what prophecy has he put on the table that has come to pass? Mm -hmm. And I ask this of Allah, Buddha, Isis, Zeus, Hercules any of these other so-called gods out here and any man that calls himself a god or son of god what prophecy have you put out here that came to pass this is what differentiates our god from any other god That's and right. anything that he says is going to happen sister and brothers you can take it to the bank period point blank and we're going to read some of his prophecy and then y'all tell me if he's a true and living god or not fair enough let's take it back to the beginning now let's go to genesis the 41st chapter since we're talking about egypt let's deal with egypt and let's see if Egypt or any of those gods was able to answer a dream that Pharaoh had. We're not going to read all of this, sisters and brothers. But we're just going to give you all the gist of the matter. And we're going to see if you want some prophecy or you want some dreams interpreted. Let's see who Pharaoh went to. Genesis chapter 41. And brother Donnie, we're going to do some skipping. We don't want to read all this for time's sake. But let's start at verse number one, and then we'll skip down. Genesis chapter 41, and let's start this at verse number one. When you get it, brother, go ahead and read. And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. So Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, he had a dream. He stood by the river, and this dream came upon him, and it troubled him because he couldn't interpret it. So since he couldn't interpret it, let's see who he first went to. Verse number eight. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream. So hold on. Pharaoh had a dream. His spirit was troubled because he didn't know what the meaning of it was. So of course he went and called his peoples, the magicians of Egypt, the priests of Ra, Horus, Isis, whomever. And he told them what was going on. Let's see if they was able to interpret the dream. Go ahead. But there was none that could interpret unto him. Now, if Egypt was all that in a bag of chips, how come couldn't one of them dudes interpret Pharaoh's dream? But you want to tell me all about the pyramids, which the Hebrews built? <laughs> like Hebrew slaves, literally. Mm -hmm. You want to tell me about all these temples, this, that, and whatever, and I'm not taking anything from the majesty that was Egypt at one point. But at the same time, they did not have the word of the Lord. And to this day, they still don't have the word of the Lord. Verse number nine. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Now the butler spoke up and told Pharaoh he remembers his faults that day. Because two years ago, he was in the county jail with Joseph. <laughs> or federal prison, whatever you want to call it. He had a dream and another guy had a dream. And Joseph the Hebrew interpreted those dreams. And Joseph asked his brother, hey, when you get out, remember me. Two full years later, the brother finally remembered Joseph. Because don't nobody remember you, Israel, even to this very day. Go ahead, verse number 10. Pharaoh was wroth with his servant and put me in ward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream in one night, I and he. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. Go ahead. And there was there with us a young man in Hebrew. A who? In Hebrew. Go ahead. Servant to the captain of the guard. 
And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man, according to his dream, he did interpret. Skip down, if you would, brother, to verse number 15, because Pharaoh ended up calling Joseph out of prison, and he wanted to get some understanding about his dream. So that should show you, sisters and brothers, who has the word of the Lord. They were in the land of Egypt. They were in Pharaoh's house, but could none of the magicians or wise men or religious leaders of Egypt answer what that dream meant. Pharaoh had to go to the Lord's true priests, which are the Hebrews. Right. And that's the same to this very day. Verse 15. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. Go ahead. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst interpret a dream to interpret. So he said, Joseph, I heard you can interpret a dream, and look how Joseph gave the glory to, verse number 16. And Joseph <clears throat> answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So the God of the Hebrews is the one that interprets the dreams. Skip down to verse number 28, because he basically told him what was going to happen with the dream, and now Joseph was about to interpret it. Verse number 28 through 30. Go ahead. This is the thing <clears throat> which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. Amen. Behold, there cometh seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. So the interpretation of the dream was there's going to be seven years of good plenty in Egypt, and after those seven years of plenty, it was going to be seven years of famine. Well, if Joseph the Hebrew wouldn't have interpreted that, Egypt would have been up the creek. If they would have had seven good years, then they would have had that famine, and all of that good would have been forgotten. So again, where was Ra, Horus, and Isis to interpret those dreams? They can't talk because they are not true gods, sisters and brothers. They mm -hmm. are idols. Right. 38 through 40, brother. Go ahead. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a man, such a one as this man, in whom the Spirit of God is? So the Spirit of God dwells in his servants, the Hebrews. Go ahead, 39 through 40. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, for as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. So he was in a land of magicians, of magicians, in a land of all these wise scholars of these comedic sciences and these Egyptian sciences, but none of them, again, could interpret a simple dream. Only the God of the Hebrews could. Go ahead, verse number 40. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. So Pharaoh still had to be the boss. He just made Joseph the conciliary, like the Don, right? That's right. <laughs> but that's okay. We just went here to show that even in Egypt in all of his glory, still didn't have the word of the Lord until he sent it to his priests, the Hebrews. And nothing is new under the sun, sister and brothers. We're going to see this again in the New Testament. Let's go quickly to Matthew, the 24th chapter now. We're not going to read all of it, but we're just going to show how the Lord puts prophecy on the table and who the prophecy, whose mouth the prophecy comes out of. So again, if the Bible copy from the Egyptian Book of the Dead, surely one of those Egyptian gods would have told Pharaoh about the famine and about the year of plenty, but they couldn't do it. Why? Because they are not gods, but only idols of men. Matthew 24, my beloved brother, and we want to read verses 1 through 7. Matthew 24, verses 1 through 7. A few more scriptures, then we're going to bring up some slides for y'all edification. Matthew chapter 24. If you've been going to the Israel God for a while, you should be very familiar with this chapter. We're not going to read all of it, but we just want to point out a few things here and there. Matthew 24. If you could, brother, pick this up at verse 1. Whenever you get it, go ahead and read. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And the disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Go ahead. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now let's look at something, sister and brothers. Jesus was talking to the apostles about the temple in Jerusalem during his day, and he prophesied and told them that the temple was not going to be left standing one stone upon another. So this right here shows that Christ showed that the temple was going to be destroyed. Now you got all the temples in Egypt being destroyed. You got all the pyramids being looted. What Egyptian God told them that was going to happen? When they went, what, 100 years ago, 1922, and they raided uh, King Tut's uh, mm -hmm. pyramid? How come they didn't tell them that all that gold was going to be taken to the British Museum? 
How come not one God told the pharaohs, hey, man, why are you building all this? They're going to come and loot everything up. They're going to even write on the wall, and they're going to color the black people white. Mm-hmm. Not one Egyptian God stood up and told these people what was going to happen. And it got so bad to the point that if you read history, they took the gold, they took King Tut and them out of the, um, the gold tombs, and they took the bodies, and they used that as firewood. Yeah, read the history. They took the Egyptian tombs, they took the bodies of the pharaohs and used that as firewood. So how come not one Egyptian god prophesied and told him, hey man, you might want to put some better locks on this dope. <laughs> <laughs> These people are going to come in and desecrate everything. Why? Because they're not the true and living god. But our god said that that temple was going to be destroyed. Go ahead, three through seven. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So the disciples knew that Jesus knew what he was talking about. And they asked him, Lord, what shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And what was the first thing that Christ told him? Verse number four. And Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. Because you got deception running rampantly all over. And we just saw that when this dude said that the book, the Bible was copied from this Egyptian book of the dead. He says, take heed, no man deceive y'all. Go ahead, five and six. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Hey, if you want to make some money, sisters and brothers, in these churches, call on the name of Jesus. It's a good name, but unfortunately, you got too many of Satan's ministers using that name, and they driving Rolls Royces and Bugattis. And now you got Muslim ministers who wanted a Rolls Royce in a private plane, and now he called on the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. There's one Muslim minister called on the name of Jesus when he called on the name of Allah. And guess what? He's riding a Rolls Royce. Because when he was calling on the name of Allah, he was just riding just a regular car. But now he wanted a fancy vehicle, he called on the name of Jesus. That money started rolling in, sisters and brothers. So this prophecy is being fulfilled. Start five again, brother. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Amen. Verse number six. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So you're going to hear wars and rumors of wars. Christ prophesied what's going to happen in the near future and stuff that's happening today. He says, be ye not troubled. All these things are going to come to pass, but the end is not yet. One more thing he prophesied, verse number seven. For nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. He said it's going to be famines pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. Didn't we just have an earthquake in Turkey? We did. Every year you got a major earthquake in some major city somewhere all over the earth, sisters and brothers. Christ prophesied this. How come this ain't talked about in the Book of the Dead? How come Horus, Isis, and Osiris ain't saying that? Because they can't speak. Somebody wrote this book in their stead and put their name on it. Mm -hmm. So Christ prophesied in the future you were going to see nation rise up against nation, Wars, kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences. We all know about this pandemic and earthquakes in diverse places. So again, he calls the end from the beginning that shows he is the true and the living God. So we just saw how the Bible establishes itself, sister and brothers, as a true word of God. No other religious book out here can declare the end from the beginning, nor can they talk about what's happening now or in the near future. And this is our history, sister and brothers. This Bible talks about, again, the so-called uh, black man. It tells us about the transatlantic slave trade. It tells us about the prison industrial complex. It tells us about single parent households, street gangs, and all other issues that negatively affect us as a people. And I, we ain't going to just talk about it. Let's prove it. And again, I would adjure you. Please go back and look at the black history as told by the prophets, the five-part series our elder brother Booby just gave. But we wanted to give you a quick recap. We ain't going to read all of this, but let's go to Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. Deuteronomy, chapter 28. And this is the DNA test to show your identity, sisters and brothers. And let's see if this happened to us as a people. And let's see if this is being spoken about in any other so-called religious book, especially dealing with the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Y'all still with us? Yeah. Praise God. Deuteronomy 28, again, we're not going to read all of this. We're going to just hit bits and pieces of it for time's sake. But we want to hit Deuteronomy 28 and verse 1. Deuteronomy 28 and 1, and we're going to skip down to 15. Can you get it, brother? Go ahead and read. 
And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. So the Lord told us as a people that he will give us a blessing if we keep his commandments. So sister and brothers, blessings are contingent upon obedience. If you want to get a blessing from the Lord, you got to be obedient unto him. That's right. Because the God that we serve does not bless disobedience. The only one that blesses disobedience is Satan the devil. So if you're walking around thinking that you're blessed and highly favored, but you don't do nothing the Lord says, you might want to check the source of that blessing because it ain't the true and living God. Amen? Amen. But I digress. Hit verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, I command thee this day that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. So again, blessings are contingent upon obedience. If you don't obey and you disobedience, that's when the curses kick in. And let's take a look at some of the examples. We're not going to read all of them, but we're just going to recap a few of them. Verse number 16, brother. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. So if you move up north, you're going to be cursed. If you move down south, you're going to be cursed. If you move in the metropolitan areas, you're going to be cursed. If you try to get away from the big city and go into the suburbs, then curses are going to follow you like bad luggage. You're going to be cursed left and right. Skip down to verse 30. Thou shalt betroth a wife. And another man shall lie with her. This happened in slavery time. A brother may have had a wife, and the master wanted her. He went in and took her. Go ahead. Thou shalt build an house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. So we built all the mansions of the, of the south, and we didn't live in those. We lived on slave road. Go ahead. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and shalt not gather the grapes thereof. So we planted cotton and tobacco in the south. We planted rice and corn in uh, Central and South America. And we planted sugar cane in the Caribbean islands, and we didn't enjoy the fruit of any of that, sister and brothers. They gave us chitlins instead. Skip down to verse 32. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long, and there shall be no might in thine hand. And there's so many ways, sister and brothers, that this came to pass, not necessarily just slavery by itself, but even today. Somebody put an uh, anonymous call to Child Protective Services that you spank your child, CPS will come in and take your child from your house. And ain't nothing you can do about it. That's happening to us, sister and brothers. This is putting the finger on us as a people. So again, if this Bible is written by the white man and it ain't no good and all that, why is it putting the finger on us to the very letter? If you could, brother, verse number, what did you read, verse 32? That was 32. Verse 43, 43 and 44. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. So the stranger that's in us going to get up very high, and we come down very low. Verse 44. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. And this is how you can tell. If you've never been to a city, how you can tell our neighborhoods, first thing you're going to see is a title max or a pawn shop next to the church's chicken and a storefront church, and of course, a couple of liquor stores. That's our neighborhood, sister and brothers, all that we can read here in the book. Skip down, if you would, brother, to verse 64. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people, from the one end of the earth even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And sister and brothers, we are in every religion under the sun. We are in Buddhism. We are in Mormonism. We are even in Satanism. And we be the biggest supporters of all these religions that ain't got nothing to do with us or the God that we serve. He says he's going to scatter us all over the earth and we're going to serve false gods, wood, and stone. And just for time's sake, let's take a look at the scattering. Verse number 68. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. Go ahead. By the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt not see it Thou shalt see it no more again, and there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. Sister and brothers, this is smack dab the transatlantic slave trade. And he said he's going to bring us into Egypt again because Egypt to us doesn't represent salvation. It doesn't represent identity. It represents bondage. 
So those pushing that comedic science and that Egyptology, what you're doing, sisters and brothers, is pushing the slave religion on us. Because we were in bondage in Egypt for those 430 plus years until the Lord sent a redeemer to get us up out of there. He's going to do that again in the near future. But let's take a look at something else. Because now you got people saying, well, that's in the past, Brother Donnie. Why y'all always bringing up stuff in the past? <laughs> we should move beyond that. That was my forefathers. It had nothing to do with me. And if you're living in the state of Florida, you can't teach history past 1970. So, oh, this is null and void anyway. So now let's teach some current events. Let's go now to 40, Isaiah chapter 42. So since y'all don't want to hear about slavery and all that, let's take a look at now the prison industrial complex, which is happening to this very day. Y'all still with us? Amen. Praise God. Isaiah chapter 42. We don't want to read all of it, but we just want to hit bits and pieces here and there. Isaiah 42, Brother Donnie, we're going to read one verse, verse 8. So we already saw the transatlantic slave um, trade. We saw our people planting crops and not getting the benefits of this. We saw us being scattered. Let's see something else. Isaiah 42 and 8. When you get it, brother, go ahead and read. I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory will I not give to another. Amen. Neither my praise to graven images. So again, the Lord is always warning us about dealing with idolatry. And since we didn't listen, that's why he put those curses on us. And let's take a look at one of these other curses that's happening to us. Verse number 17. They shall be turned back. They shall be greatly ashamed. That trust in graven images. That say to the molten images, ye are gods. And when you're dealing with comedic sciences and Egyptian schools of mystery, you are dealing with gods and goddesses pagan images, and idolatry. Verse number 22, brother. But this is a people robbed and spoiled. Talking about the children of Israel, the book says we are robbed and we are spoiled. Go ahead. They are all of them snared in holes, and they are hid in prison houses. They are hid where? In prison houses. That's the prison industrial complex. Go ahead. They are for a prey, and none delivereth, for a spoil, and none saith, restore. And if you look in all the prisons, sister and brothers, we are a minority in the population, but we are a majority in the prisons. Why? Because it, they say it, co it uh, costs an average of what? Between fifty-five and 75000 to house one inmate. So you are worth more in the penal system than you are worth on the street, sister and brothers. Because you being locked up, you pay the judge, you pay the prosecutor, you pay the district attorney, you pay the... Um, you pay the, um, the warden, you pay the salaries of the COs and everybody else. They make merchandise and profit off of you. So, mm -hmm. of course, they're going to lock you up because, again, you work more, more in the prison than you are on the streets. And now they got privatized prisons, which you work even more. So that's what the Lord says, that we are hid in these prison houses and none is going to deliver us. 23 to 25. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? Who gave Jacob for a spoil and Israel to the robbers? So who did this to us, sister and brothers? And look at the answer. Did not the Lord? He against whom we have sinned? So the Lord put us in these prison houses because we sinned against him. But he gave us fair warning ahead of time. We could have avoided all of this if we would have obeyed. And now we still disobeying. And our preachers are teaching us to disobey. And we're wondering why we are still stuck in the system. Go ahead. For they would not walk in his ways. Neither were they obedient unto his law. When you tell somebody they got to keep the law, it's like you're talking about their mother. Because they are not trying to hear this, especially from the pulpit. 25. Therefore he hath poured upon him the fury of his anger and the strength of battle. And it, is, and it hath set him on fire round about, yet he knoweth not. And it burned him, yet he laid it not to heart. And all this stuff is happening to us as a people, and we are not taking any heed to it. We are not paying attention to it. We are just getting burnt, and we are not calling upon our Redeemer to save us up out of this drama. One more place here. Let's go to Isaiah 51. So we talked about the transatlantic slave trade that happened to our people. We talked about the prison industrial complex that happened to our people. I'm sorry, we skipped one. Isaiah chapter 3. Mm -hmm. Isaiah chapter 3. Now we got to talk about the single family households. So all this stuff is happening and pointing the finger at us as a people from the pages of this holy Bible, which people teach is plagiarized or it's no good or it's a fable or a fantasy. Then why are we looking at ourselves in the mirror from this book? And you can't find none of that in this Egyptian book of the dead, which they claim was 
the Bible plagiarized from. We're going to open this book in a minute to see what it actually says. Isaiah chapter 3, let's start this at verse number 1. And then we're going to skip. Isaiah 3, verses 1, and then we're going to skip. When you get it, brother, go ahead and read. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, does take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. So the Lord, again, is talking about his people, the children of Israel. Go ahead, verse number 4. And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. So one of the things he prophesied because of our disobedience is he's going to have children to be our princes and babes to rule over them. Go ahead, verse number five. And the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. So everybody's going to oppress each other. We are not going to have no black-on-black -black love whatsoever. It's going to be the exact opposite. Go ahead. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient. Now you got little kids cussing out old people. And how dare you say something to them? Now the mother want to jump in and fight you. Mm -hmm. And that's how bad it's gotten in our community, sisters and brothers. Go ahead. And the base against the honorable. And the base against the honorable people. Skip down to verse number 12. As for my people, children are their oppressors. So as for his people, children are their oppressors. I was talking to Brother Andre on the way here about the mall that we had opened up in Georgia, Lithonia Stonecrest, opened up about maybe 15 years ago, and it took five years for Jake to mess that mall up. <laughs> you don't even want to go up in there now because those kids are so out of pocket. Nice mall. It still looks good from the outside, but once you get in there, you see how messed up it is. Why? Because people are not raising their kids, and they don't want nobody else to raise their kids either. It's all done uh, systematically because you don't raise your knuckle-headed son. You let the schools do whatever they want. They don't want to discipline them in the school. They don't want to send them home to you because you don't want to discipline them. So what's going to happen? He's going to have that, um, that attitude that the world owes him something. He's going to get out these streets when he's 18. They're going to lock his behind up. He's going to be worth $75,000 a year in the prison industrial complex. Sisters and brothers, this is happening to us as a people and nobody else all prophesied in the pages of the Holy Bible that everybody want to tell you not to read. So again, you take the Bible away, what this book telling me? Pharaoh was black. And? <laughs> <laughs> I'm black, your point? <laughs> Let's continue, brother. Where you at? Middle of 12. Start 12 again. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. Oh, we don't like to hear that. But it's definitely true. It says women rule over them. Go ahead. O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to error and destroy the way of thy paths. I know Brother Boo always likes to tell a story like on Chicago, you look at the uh, train stop, I believe it's 95th, the last stop on the train. Mm -hmm. And early in the morning when you see people going to work, it's 99% black women and a few brothers spread out here and there. And I've seen that on Chicago and I've also seen it in Atlanta too because we got two end stops uh, Indian Creek and Kensington and I used to ride the train early in the morning the train started at 5 o'clock in the morning and guess who you would see on the platform waiting for the train 99% sisters few brothers scattered here and there but every brother wasn't going to work you had some brothers sleeping on the train and you had the other brothers begging so this is actually talking about our people sister and brothers why is this happening to us because we disobeyed our God and he put all these dramas and these curses on us to wake us up but we're not paying attention. We want to go out and we want to worship Ra, Isis, and all these other gods and goddesses that came here. And we wonder why we are still in the hell that we are in today. One more place, and we're going to go to a slide. Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah chapter 51. We're going to read one verse, verse 20. So again, all these problems that's plaguing us that the so-called conscious community claims to have the solutions for, all these problems are found in the pages of the Holy Bible, sisters and brothers, that they want to tell you to throw away. Isaiah 51 and 20. When you get it, go ahead and read. Thy sons have fainted. Still talking about the children of Israel. Now he's talking about our young men. Go ahead. They lie at the head of all the streets. We are in every street corner in our neighborhood doing what? As a wild bull in a net. Drinking 40, smoking blunts, doing everything we ain't got no business doing. Go ahead. They are full of the fury of the Lord. The rebuke of thy God. You got it to the point now you don't even want to walk to the store in your own neighborhood because you're afraid you might get mugged by one of these young guys out here. Hey, every brother out here ain't bad, but all it takes is just a few. Amen? Mm -hmm. So let's continue. So now you see, where I got one question. All these conditions we just read about, can you find one 
in these other books. No, you thank you. You can't. Because again, these are not the true and living God. You won't find any of these conditions in any Egyptian, Afrocentric, Kemetic, or Islamic book. But the first thing they want to come out your their mouth is saying that the Bible was stolen from ancient Egyptian writings. So we're gonna look what the Bible says about Egypt. If we can bring up slide number three, brother. Y'all should be familiar with this definition. You can go to slide three. Well, I could open that. Y'all had to walk up here. <laughs> Praise God. Thank y'all for working in the vineyard. So we got a couple of slides here. We all should be familiar with this. This is from the Compact Bible Dictionary, and this is the definition of Ham. When you get it, brother, go ahead and read, and we're going to show you why we're reading this. Go ahead. Ham, the youngest son of Noah, born probably about 96 years before the flood. Go ahead. And one of the eight persons to live through the flood. Amen. He became the progenitor of the dark races. So Ham is the progenitor or father of the so-called dark races. Go ahead. Not the Negroes. But not the Negroes. That's us in America and the slaves that were shipped all over the world. Go ahead. But the Egyptians. So Ham is the father of the Egyptians. Go ahead. Ethiopians, Libyans, and the Canaanites. So Ham, if you go to Genesis, the 10th chapter, he had four sons and Mizraim or Egypt was one of his sons. So Egypt and Israel looked alike but they are two different people. Let's go to Exodus, the first chapter, and prove that. And again, sister and brothers, we definitely will encourage you to take a look at black history as told by the prophets. It gives you a full breakdown of all of this, but we're just going to hit a few bits and pieces here, and y'all stick with us because there's a method to our madness. Exodus chapter 1, we're not going to read all of this, but we're going to read about how our people fared in Egypt, and it really baffles me why they're trying to go back. Exodus chapter 1, if you could, brother, let's pick this up at verse number 6. We're going to read 6 through 12, and then we're going to skip. Exodus 1, 6 through 12. When you get it, go ahead and read. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. That's the same Joseph that interpreted the dream of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh made him the governor of all of Egypt. But then Joseph ended up dying, and all the people in that generation. But look what happened during their reign, verse number 7. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with them. So the Lord blessed us in the land of Egypt and we multiplied and we grew. But then something happened. Verse number eight. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. So people have short term memories. Joseph was the one that saved Egypt from famine. But then a new Pharaoh came up later on and he forgot all about the contributions of Joseph and all about the contributions of the children of Israel. And this is what he wanted to do. Verse number nine. And he said unto his people, behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. So he saw that Israel was multiplying and he got scared and he told his Egyptians, look, these people are rising up and they're going to be stronger than us. So let's deal with them. Verse number 10. Come on, let us deal wisely with them. Lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when they falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them out of the land. Now Israel wasn't trying to do that, but they went ahead and put those false charges on us, so then they started making us slaves. Verse number 11. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built, the Pharaoh, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. So all the stuff you see over in Egypt that brothers is pointing to, the Sphinx, the pyramids and all that, that was built by our people as slaves. They literally worked us as Hebrew slaves because that's what we were, Hebrew slaves, sisters and brothers. Slavery didn't start over in America in the 1600s. It started back in Egypt by people that looked just like us. Skip down, if you will, brother, to verse number 15. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifra and the name of the other Pua. You know what? I missed something, brother. Verse 12. We got to read verse 12. Exodus 1 and 12. But the, more they but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. So they called themselves afflicting us, thinking that was going to stop our population growth. But the more you afflict us, the more babies that we have. Why? Because Jake is fertile. The last person that needs to be having a whole bunch of babies is the main one that has a whole bunch of babies. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Start 12 again, brother. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Go ahead. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. Like I said, our people is very, very fertile. 
Skip down, if you would, to verse 15 now, 15 through 17. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifra, and the name of the other was Pua. So you had two midwives that was responsible for delivering the Hebrew children, and then Pharaoh came and talked to them, and look what he told them, verse 16 and 17. And he said, When ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. That's eugenics, sisters and brothers. They wanted to kill all the men because they know that the son carry the seed, but they wanted to keep the daughters alive. Go ahead, verse 17. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. Praise God. So the first so-called abortion clinics, these were in uh, Egypt. They were trying to open them up. So you can't blame Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood. All that started in Egypt with black people that look just like you and me that was trying to kill you and me. So Mr. Kemetic Scholar, why are you still trying to deal with this? They was trying to kill your people. But now folks get short-term memory, Brother Donnie, so they don't want to talk about that. <laughs> Skip down to verse number 22. All we're doing, sisters and brothers, is reading the book. And let the book speak for itself. The book says, let God be true and every man a liar, right? Mm -hmm. All we're doing is reading the book. Verse 22. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. So since the midwives wouldn't kill the boys, Pharaoh told his people, Every male child you cast in the river, and keep all the daughters alive. So this is the beginning of gator bait. And you had that even in Louisiana during slavery. They would put little black children on the riverbanks, so a gator would come up and bite them, and they would uh, kill the alligator and make alligator shoes and alligator wallets. But you can't just blame the Gentile in this for that. He got that from the Egyptians. Again, black people that look just like you and me. Why? Because the Lord allowed that to happen because he wanted to raise up Pharaoh so he can show that he is a true and living God. So we can't point. It's not about color, sister and brothers. It's about righteousness. Let's go quickly to Psalms 105. Acts. Acts. Okay. okay. Praise God. I was going to skip it since y'all asked. I'll read it. <laughs> Acts chapter 7. See, I'm trying to cut the lesson, but y'all want to hear it? Yeah. Oh, praise God. Okay. All glory to God. Acts chapter 7. We're going to read 17 through 22. Acts chapter 7, 17 and 22. Because, again, you got these same people that tell you that the Bible contradicts itself. Well, let's read something here. Acts 17, excuse me, Acts chapter 7 and verse 17. When you get it, brother, go ahead and read. But when the time of the promise drew nigh which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. We just read about that time. Go ahead. Till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. Didn't we literally just read that in Exodus, the first chapter? Mm -hmm. So the Bible contradicts itself, then why are these two things lining up? You see how people say some blanket statements, don't know what in the world they're talking about? Yeah. That's all right. You ain't got to argue with nobody. Just open the book up on them. Verse 19. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, Go. so that they cast out their young their young children, to the end they might not live. Same thing which we just read about, and now we're going to read about Moses. Go ahead, verse 20 to 22. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. Amen. And when, his, and when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her, own, for her own son. So Moses passed as an Egyptian. Why? Because he looked just like an Egyptian, but they were two different people. Egyptians were from Ham, and the Israelites were from Shem. Go ahead, verse 22. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. So uh, Moses grew up in the palace of Pharaoh. He was learned in all the Egyptian cultures of agriculture, warfare, finance, or whatever else. But where did the Egyptians get this wisdom from? Because they couldn't interpret the dream that the Lord gave Pharaoh because it was up to the Egyptians. They would have starved during those seven years of famine. Let's see who gave the Egyptians the wisdom that Moses later learned. And this is one of the reasons why they want to say that Moses copied the Ten Commandments from the so-called Egyptian Book of the Dead. Because they'll say, well, see, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And the question we have to ask is, who gave the Egyptians the wisdom that Moses learned? I'm glad y'all asked that. The Bible answers that for us. Psalms 105. Psalms chapter 105. We're going to start this at verse 16. Y'all still with us? Yeah. Praise God. Psalms 105 and 16. We getting there, y'all. We getting there. Psalms 105 and 16. 
Whenever you get it, Brother Donnie, go ahead and read. Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. He broke the whole staff of bread. Go ahead. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant. So we read about Joseph earlier. Again, if the Bible contradicts itself, why is Psalms, Exodus, and Acts all saying the same thing? Because, again, these folks ain't read the Bible, so how are they going to tell you about it? Go ahead. Whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron. So Joseph had an ankle bracelet? Nothing new under the sun, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead, verse 19. Until the time that his word came, and the word of the Lord tried him. Go ahead. The king sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. Amen. He made him lord over his house and ruler of all his substance. We read about that in uh, Genesis. Go ahead. To bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his senators wisdom. So who taught the senators and the wise men of Egypt wisdom? Joseph, Joseph the Hebrew. And he got that from the Lord, sister and brothers, because all wisdom comes from the Lord. That's right. And any wisdom that Egypt had... They got from the Hebrew Joseph, and it was passed down 400 years later to the Hebrew Moses. So again, if the Bible is written by the white man, Yeshua is talking about a whole lot of smart, rich black people, is it not? <laughs> See, our brothers make blanket statements and don't have a clue to what they're talking about. But let's take a look at something here, y'all, because you got some of these comedic scholars. They'll say that Moses stole the Ten Commandments from the 42 Principles of Mayot, which is from this book, The Book of the Dead. Then you'll say that they stole it from the Egyptian school of the mysteries. So if that's the case, if this Bible took from this book, then there should be no contradictions between the two, right? Let's see if they got any contradictions. Let's go to slide number four, if y'all would. Slide number four. And that should be entitled, What Did the Egyptians Eat? So if Moses stole all of his writings from the Egyptian book of the dead, they should have the same dietary law as the Hebrews, right? Let's see if that's the case. Let's go to slide number five now. And this is from a book called The Encyclopedia of Ancient Egypt, page 400. And that's that gold from King Tut that they stole that nobody <laughs> prophesied and told them about. <laughs> that's why we're looking at it right now. That's right. But that's not why we're going here. This is Encyclopedia of Ancient Egypt, page 400. This is called Meat on the Table. We want to see what the ancient Egyptians ate. Now, one thing I want to put out here now, sisters and brothers, you talk to anybody that claims they deal with Egyptology or they claim they deal with comedic science or even Afrocentricism, you ask them if they eat pork, they'll say no, which is a good thing. You're not supposed to eat pork. But let's see if the ancient Egyptians ate pork. Read that, brother. Meat on the table. Yes, sir. There was a good variety of alternatives to eating beef. So besides eating beef, there was other meat that the Egyptians ate. Go ahead. As well as the common domesticated animals, such as sheep, goats, and pigs. And what? And pigs. You mean the Egyptians didn't keep kosher? No, no, no. Go ahead. Egyptians also ate games such as gazelles, hares, oh, and... Oh, they, they ate bunny rabbits? Hares. Go ahead. And antelopes. And what else? In addition, hyenas... Hyenas? You got to be pretty hungry to eat a hyena, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> or, or just a glutton. Go ahead. And various types of wild birds were captured and force-fed for food. So wait a minute. These Egyptians who Moses stole his dietary law from, they was eating pigs, they was eating rabbits, and they was eating hyenas. Somebody ain't telling y'all the whole truth, sister and brothers. But we got some more. Go to the next slide, slide number six. This is from the same book, Encyclopedia of e Ancient Egypt. This is the next page, 401. What else was on the menu? Go ahead. Goose on the menu. Goose. Go ahead. In their tombs, Egyptians surrounded themselves with images of feasting as well as with actual meals and models of foodstuffs. So if you go into these Egyptian pyramids and tombs, they had actual models of the meals that they actually ate. Go ahead. This goose, trusted and plucked, ready to be cooked, was found in a tomb of the Old Kingdom, the years 2,686 to 2,181 BC. And they also, and I didn't put a picture of it up, but they also had a tomb in the shape of a goose that was going to be eaten by these Egyptians in the Old Kingdom. So we see that the Egyptians ate goose, they ate hyenas, they ate pigs, and they ate rabbits. Could Moses and the children of Israel eat that madness? I'm sure y'all know the answer to that, but let's read the Bible. You know where we're going? Deuteronomy 14. Because again, if the Bible plagiarizes the Egyptian book of the dead and all these Egyptian writings, then the Bible should be telling you you can eat what the Egyptians ate, right? That's pretty simple. But let's see if that's the case. Deuteronomy chapter 14 
This is the dietary law. Let's get right to the point. Start at verse number 6. Deuteronomy chapter 14, we're going to read 6 through 8, and then we're going to skip. When you get it, brother, go ahead and read. And every beast that parteth the hoof, and cleaveth the cleft into two, ha into two claws, and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that ye shall eat. So the Lord gave us a dietary law and the criteria of the animals we can eat. It has to part the hoof, it has to be cleft in two claws or cloven-footed, and it has to chew the cud. If you go up, he gives you examples of roebuck, deer, sheep, wild goats, oxes, etc. Go ahead, verse number 7. Nevertheless, these ye shall not eat of them that cheweth the cud. Go ahead. Or of them that divide the cloven hoof. As the camel. As the what? As the camel. Now, I didn't bring this today because it's going to be, it'll be too long. But if you go into the Islamic book of the Quran, their God allows them to eat camel. And that's the very first animal the Lord told us not to eat. What else did the Lord tell us not to eat? And the hare. The hare, the same bunny rabbit that the Egyptians was eating. Mm -hmm. So if the Bible was uh, plagiarized or plagiarized from the Egyptian book of the dead or their writings, how come the Bible says don't eat the hare or the rabbit and Egypt tells you that you can't? Why? Because you're dealing with different God sisters and brothers. All you got to do is put the evidence on the table. Go ahead and finish it out, brother. And the coney. For they cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. Therefore, they are unclean unto you. What else is unclean to us that the Egyptians ate? Verse number eight. And the swine. So the Egyptians ate the pork chops and the ham hocks. We're not supposed to eat that, sister and brothers. Go ahead. Because it divideth the hoof, yet cheweth not the cud. It is unclean unto you. Ye shall not eat of their flesh, nor touch their dead carcass. So the Lord says, don't eat of the pig's flesh or touch their dead carcass. One more. Verse number 16. Let's see about the goose. Go ahead. The little <coughs> owl and the great owl and the swan. So the swan is in the family of goose, ducks, and geese. The Lord told us we can't eat the swan. Mm -hmm. So wait a minute. Moses wrote that you can't eat the bunny rabbit. You can't eat the swine. And you can't eat the uh, swan or the goose, but the Egyptians ate all those things and more. So, sister and brother, did the Bible plagiarize from the Egyptian writings? No. That means somebody is lying, right? Like the book says, let God be true and let every man be a liar. But let's continue, my beloved sister and brothers. We don't want to get too far in the dietary law. That should be good enough in and of itself. If you could, brother, let's go to slide number seven. Feminization of the black male. Now, that's a really big subject among these comedics and these Afrocentric scholars. And with this, they are actually right, but they're wrong in their source. Because you got a lot of brothers out here that will make videos talking about how in Hollywood, they always want to put a dress on a man. Dave Chappelle talked about it. And the other brothers talked about it. You know, why they all want to make blacks homosexual in Hollywood, this, that, and whatever. I don't disagree with that. However, when these comedic scholars talk about it, they're not giving you the source of why this is forbidden. Let's see if Egypt had a problem with the effeminization of the black man. Go to the next slide if you would, brother. This is called World History Encyclopedia, and the website is called worldhistory.org. And I want my brother Donnie to read this for y'all. Go ahead. The Negative Confessions. So this is called the Negative Confessions, also called Mayat, M-A-A-T, these are the 42 things that they say Moses plagiarized the Ten Commandments from. Well, let's see if that's the case. Go ahead. The negative confession is a list of 42 sins which the soul of the deceased can honestly say it has, com it has not committed when it stands in judgment in the afterlife. So apparently, according to Egyptian theology, when a person dies and he goes into the afterlife, he has a list of 42 sins which he says he has not committed when he stands in judgment. Go ahead. The most famous list comes from the Papyrus Ani, a text of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And this is what we got right here. That's what we're going to read to y'all. So this is the most famous one. Go ahead. There is no standard negative confession. So we just read the Ten Commandments earlier, sisters and brothers, but for the Egyptians, there is no standard negative confession. The only thing that's similar is you got 42 sins, but they're tailored to the individual. Go ahead. The confession from the Papyrus Annie is best known only because the text is so famous and so often reproduced. So this is the one that we're going to read from because it's the most famous and it's also reproduced. And I know this for a fact because when I did this lesson a few years ago and I went online to print a copy of the 42 confessions, every print I got was different confessions. And now I found out why, because they are not standard, they are tailored to the individual person. Go ahead. 
As noted, scribes would tailor a text to the individual. And so while there was a standard number of 42 confessions, the sins which are listed varied from text to text. So Donnie might be able to get away with something, but I'm not. That's not <laughs> righteous, is it, sister and brothers? No, no, no. <laughs> now look what else was approved of in ancient Egypt. Go ahead. Drunkenness was approved of in ancient Egypt. So you can get towed up from the floor up in ancient Egypt. Go ahead. As was premarital sex. And you get your freak on too in, pre in Egypt. Go ahead. But only under certain conditions. But only under certain conditions. There are caveats with that. Go ahead. One can get as drunk as one wished at a festival or party, but not at work. So you can go to the club and get towed up, but not at work. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. And one could have as much premarital sex as one wanted but not with a person who was already married. So you can't be an adulterer, but you can be a fornicator. Maybe that's why brother's pushing that comedic doctrine. Mm. <laughs> mm. Along with getting toe up. Go ahead. Now look at something else here. Go ahead. The same may have held for homosexual relationships. Now they about to talk about the effeminization, if there is any. Go ahead. Nowhere in Egyptian literature or religious texts is homosexual, uh, homosexuality condemned. I don't think they heard you in the back, Brother Donnie. I want you to read that part again for the Egyptian scholars in TV land. Say nowhere, that again. Nowhere in Egyptian literature. Nowhere or, in Egyptian literature. Or religious text. Or religious text. Is homosexuality condemned. Is homosexuality condemned. And if you look at some of these brothers that push that doctrine, some of them look like they got some sugar in their tank. <laughs> we ain't going to go there today. Your brother said a lot. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so let's continue, sister and brothers. Let's now go to, y'all know where we're going, Leviticus chapter 18. So again, we're not pointing the fingers at nobody. We're not disrespecting nobody. According to the Egyptian religious writings and theology, there's nowhere in there that says that homosexuality is wrong. And they teach you that you can drink all you want as long as you're not at the gig. They teach you can lay it with anybody and everybody as long as they aren't married. But let's see if the Bible goes with that. Leviticus chapter 18, brother. Let's start this at verse number one. Let's read a little bit. Y'all mind we read some book today? Yeah. Praise God. We got to read this. Leviticus 18, one through three. When you get it, brother, go ahead and read. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. So the Lord is speaking to Moses, and he told him to tell the children of Israel, he's the Lord their God. Now look at verse 3. I want y'all to highlight this. Go ahead. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, ye shall not do. So he said in verse 3, whatever y'all saw them doing in the land of Egypt, what we just read about, I don't want y'all to do. Go ahead. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whether I bring you, shall ye not do. And when you go into the promised land in the land of Canaan, however they get down, I don't want y'all to get down, down that way either. Go ahead. Neither shall you walk in their ordinances. So don't do like the Egyptians and don't do like the Canaanites. How did the Egyptians and the Canaanites get down? Verse number 22. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. I don't have to interpret that, do I, sister and brothers? Not at all. Verse 23, look how else they got down. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Go ahead. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. It is confusion. Again, we used not to point fingers with disrespect. This is to show how the people in the land of Egypt got down. And this is how to show how the land of the people in Canaan got down. And the Lord told the Israelites not to be dealing with any of that. 26 and 27. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments and shall not commit any of these abominations. We didn't read them all, but the Lord says you should not commit any of those abominations. Go ahead. Neither any of your nation. So neither of you. Children of Israel, go ahead. Nor any stranger that sojourneth among you. Or any stranger that sojourns among you. One law for the Jew and one law for the stranger that dwells amongst them. Why? Verse 27. For all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled. So the Lord said, all of these abominations have the men in the land done before you. The ones in Egypt and the ones in Canaan. And that's why those lands were defiled. And the Lord told us not to deal with that. So when you're dealing with the effeminization of the black man, that's a good thing to bring that out, but show where it came from. You can't point it in the Bible, say the Bible allows that. In fact, the Bible speaks against it. So my question is, how come the Egyptians ain't speaking against it? Why? Because they was down for whatever. I repeat, they was down for whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to Deuteronomy 22. Since they're talking about putting a man putting on a dress, 
Let's see if the Lord allows that. Deuteronomy 22. Because again, when brothers get conscious, they get some understanding, but they're not given the source of where this understanding is coming from. All that stuff y'all saying is true, but you can see that forbidden in the pages of the Bible that y'all trying to throw away. Deuteronomy chapter 22. Let's take a look at cross-dressing. Deuteronomy 22 and verse 5. Deuteronomy 22 and 5. And when you get it, brother, go ahead and read. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. So a man is not supposed to wear a dress. So y'all are right, brothers. A man is not supposed to wear a dress. But you see that in the pages of the Holy Bible. You don't see that in any of these religious books. Go ahead. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. So all this cross-dressing and stuff that these brothers are speaking righteously against, that's a good thing, but give the source, brothers. Don't try to say that that didn't come from the pages of the Bible when we see that the Bible forbids that. So if you're saying that uh, comedic science and all that stuff originated that, just show us in the pages where any of these comedic people say you can't do that. You can't because we just show you in the history that nowhere in any Egyptian writings was homosexuality spoken against. Last place here, my beloved brother, and we winding it down. Y'all y'all still with us? Yeah. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Ain't the last scripture, but the last thing on this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to do verse 9 through 11. Let's pick it up a bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we want to read 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, let's read 9 through 11. Whenever you get it, brother, go ahead and read. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Go ahead. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. So no, neither adulterers, nor idolaters, nor fornicators, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Go ahead. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But didn't we just read the history that Egyptian says you can be a fornicator? The Egyptians said you can be a homosexual. Yeah. The Egyptians said that you can be effeminate. Yeah. But according to the word of the Lord, you do any of this stuff, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to take your salvation away from you, sister and brothers. No, how, no matter how ser sincere they try to be about history or nationality, because that's not our history, that's not our nationality. But there's good news, y'all, because the good thing about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he don't leave you hanging. He's a merciful God. Verse number uh, 11. And such were some of you, but ye were washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. So we don't want y'all to think that we just pointed fingers at the homosexuals. If you were dealing with any of these lifestyles, repent, sister and brothers, and turn back to your Creator, and He is righteous enough and graceful to forgive. Amen? Amen. So turn to your God. Let's go now to a couple more places. Let's hit the knife slide right now. And this is what this whole lesson is about. I think we already answered the question, but we're going to read from this. So slide number nine says, were the Ten Commandments plagiarized from Egypt? I think you already know the answer to that is no. But let's go ahead, since I've been holding this book up all day, let's read from this book and see exactly what it is about. Let's go now to the next slide, if you could, brother. This is the Egyptian Book of the Dead, so-called. This is page 346, and this is talking about the 42 negative confessions. Now, contrary to, purpose, contrary to popular belief, these aren't 42 commandments. Let's see exactly what these are. And when you run into the brothers talking about maya and all that, they will never tell you this. And I learned this myself. Go ahead. 42 negative confessions. The hall of double right and truth wherein Ani, the scribe, has to address severally 42 gods who are seated in a row in the middle of the hall. So these 42 negative confessions are 42 confessions to 42 different gods. But the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob says, Hero is where the Lord our God is one Lord. But here, y'all dealing with 42 different gods. So y'all deep into that polytheism. So it's not just the 42 commandments that Moses only took 10 of them. These are 42 gods that they address during death or whenever they, whatever their uh, judgment is. And let's take a look at some of these. Uh, next page, next slide. This is the Egyptian Book of the Dead, page 346. These are just three of them, sister and brothers, because they said that Moses plagiarized all 10. But like I said, there's no 42 standard, and we're looking at 
about three of them right now that might be similar to the commandments. But look at the difference. Go ahead and read that, brother. Number three. Hail Fenty. So Fenty is one of those 42 guys that you're standing before. And what do you tell him? Go ahead. Who comes forth from him and new. I have not stolen. So you tell him Fenty, this one of these 42 gods you have not stolen. Go ahead. Hail Neba. So Neba is another of those 42 gods. What do you tell them? Who comest and goest, I have not uttered lies. Go ahead, next one. Hail Monty. Oh, Monty is another one of those guys. So these are three guys out of the 42 that the dead Egyptians stand before, and they tell them these negative confessions, I have not done any of this. Go ahead. Who comes forth from the Kebet chamber? I have not defiled the wife of any man. Now, how come he didn't tell any of these 42 I have not laid with another dude? Because <laughs> that was not forbidden in ancient Egypt, sisters and brothers. So did the Bible, did Moses take the Ten Commandments from these 42 negative confessions? No, he has not. Some of them might be similar, but I only found three, and that's with this one guy. If I look for another guy, none of these might be similar. So you can't put that on the table saying that Moses stole these, because the question is, then why are Egyptians eating pigs, rabbits, hyenas, and goose, and all that stuff? How come they laying with other men? How come they getting drunk at all times of the day except at work? How come they fornicating left and right, doing everything that the Bible tells us not to do? Because you're dealing with two different gods. Well, you're dealing with one God and 42 other gods. Amen. <laughs> All different. So I'm praying this is making sense, sister and brothers. You know, let's go back to the law. Now, let's go to Exodus chapter 20. We read this early. We're not going to read all of it. We're going to show you that these are different gods that we are dealing with. Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments, we're going to just read one through four. And that should be good to show that Moses did not plagiarize these. Exodus 20, one through four. When you get it, go ahead and read. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So again, Egypt is not our uh, place that we want to go. It's not the promised land. It is the house of bondage that the Lord brought us away from. And he told us in Leviticus 18 and 19 not to deal with any of the um, practices they were doing. Go ahead, three. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. But the Egyptians got at least 42. Now, this is 42 for the negative confession. This is not counting Horus, Iris, and the rest of the pantheon. Mm -hmm. So they got hundreds, maybe even thousands of gods. But the God of this Bible says, have no other gods before him. Go ahead, verse number four. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. And Egyptians had every kind of god from the, uh, the sun god Ra, to the god that's a dun beagle that they call the scarab beetle. Mm -hmm. So they had gods all over the place, and the Lord told us not to deal with that. So sisters and brothers, we pray that that proved that Moses did not take the Ten Commandments from the so-called Book of the Dead. If you could, brothers, go to the next slide, slide number 12, and let's deal with now the motherland. Next slide, slide 12, please. So the question now, where is the motherland? Because people are trying to send you back to Egypt, which is bondage, or they might be trying to send you back to Africa, or they might be trying to send you back to Mecca. But the Bible tells us where our motherland is and what our inheritance is. We read some of it earlier, but let's get right to the point. We've got about a few more after this, then we'll close it out. Let's go to uh, Galatians, the fourth chapter. Galatians chapter 4. And let's pick this up at verse number 26. We got one more slide after this. We got about four more scriptures. And then we'll close it out. Galatians chapter 4. We're going to read one verse, Brother Donnie, verse 26. And whenever you get it, my beloved brother, go ahead and read. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So the mother of us all, sister and brothers, is Jerusalem. That's right. Not Africa, not Egypt, not Mecca, not Wakanda. <laughs> Jerusalem, amen. Amen. Because <laughs> we'll make up a land trying to be some people <laughs> that we ain't. Go to one more place, Psalms 137. And since we're talking about Jerusalem, which is Zion, let's see what our people sang about. Psalms 137 chapter. All you got to do, sister and brothers, again, you ain't got to argue with nobody. You don't have to offend anybody. You don't have to take offense when they disrespect the Bible because maybe 99 times out of 100, they really haven't read. You know they haven't read any of these scriptures we brought out today because, again, they're being taught by false prophets. 
So what the book says, be apt to teach, be patient, and just show the people if they can receive it, what thus said the Lord. Put everything on the table and let them make the decision, and prayerfully the Lord will give the increase of the seed that you planted. Psalms 137, my beloved brother. Let's start this at verse number one. When you get it, go ahead and read. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yeah, we wept when we remembered Zion. Because the Lord told us in Deuteronomy 28, he's going to scatter us all over the world if we disobeyed his commandments. And one of the places where he sent us was Babylon. Go ahead. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. So when we was in Babylon, we remembered Zion or Jerusalem, and we started crying because of the memory of us being free. Go ahead, verse 3. For there they carried us away, captive, required of us a song. And they that, wait, and they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. So they carried us away captive. They worked us as Hebrew slaves. Then they had a nerve to ask us to sing for them while we was working. Go ahead. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? But this is rhetorically. How do we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? We're going to show you. Go ahead, verse 5. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. So even in captivity, even in Babylon, no matter where we find ourselves, our people was not going to forget our motherland, which we read is Jerusalem or Zion. Verse number 6. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. Go ahead. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. So, Brother Tony, why did you read that? There's a method to our madness, sister and brothers, because when we were slaves in this hemisphere, we were singing songs called Negro spirituals. And if you could, brother, bring up that next slide, verse number 13. So when we was in the cotton fields in Georgia, Alabama, even in Maryland, we were singing so-called Negro spirituals. Let's say we were singing about Mecca, if we were singing about Egypt, we were singing about Kemet, Africa, or any of these other lands. What's the first song up there? There's plenty of them. Y'all can go to negrospirituals.com. I'm sure y'all might be familiar with some of them. But let's take a look at some of these songs our people were singing. What's the first song? Babylon's Falling. Babylon's Falling. Because that just fulfilled this prophecy right here. We was in Babylon. We're going to be singing and crying about Zion. Go ahead, next song. Bound for Canaan's land. Bound for Egypt. For Canaan. So bound for Zion, which is the promised land. Mm -hmm. Now, we did sing about Egypt. What did we sing? Next song. Turn back Pharaoh's army. So we said, get away from Pharaoh. Turn back his army. Because they knew that Egypt was bondage, sisters and brothers. What else did we sing about in the cotton fields? Go ahead. Go down Moses. If you know the rest of that, it says, let my people go, right? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, next song. Joshua fight the battle of Jericho. So we weren't singing about, again, Africa or Islam or anything like that. We were singing about the people in the Bible. Joshua, go fight the battle of Jericho. Go ahead. There's a bomb in Gilead. Shout out to Brother Julius. A bomb in Gilead. That also was a Negro spiritual because we knew we had healing in the word of the Lord. Go ahead. Michael, row your boat ashore. I'm sure y'all all sang that in grade school. Michael, row your boat ashore. It's talking about salvation. Michael, the archangel. Ain't talking about Michael B. Jordan, sisters. <laughs> Michael, the archangel. <laughs> What's the next song? Go ahead. We're marching to Zion. Now we march to Wakanda. We're marching to Zion. Wakanda forever? Zion. All right. right. Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> so we always knew where we was from, sisters and brothers, even in the cotton fields, even in the tobacco fields, even in the rice paddies. We all knew where we was from. And again, to prove that we wasn't dealing with Egypt on a good level, what was that last one? Did an old Pharaoh get lost? If you read the lyrics of that song, it says he got lost in the Red Sea. And we telling Pharaoh today to get lost with all that bad doctrine. That's right. So, sisters and brothers, we're going to let y'all in on a little secret. Slaves didn't read. It was against the law to teach a slave how to read. So if a slave couldn't read this Bible, how did he know about Babylon, Canaan, Moses, Joshua, Michael, Zion, even Pharaoh? Why? Because our people always knew who we were, sisters and brothers. They had to end up beating it out of us. They didn't beat Christianity into us. They beat our identity out of us. And identity had nothing to do with Chaka Zulu or anybody like that. We were the children of Israel. Amen? Amen. So I put this on the table to anybody pushing that comedic science. How come we weren't rapping about Ra, Isis, <laughs> Horus, any of these guys? Anytime we spoke of Egypt, we spoke of it as bondage, and we say Pharaoh lost. So why are you trying to get on the losing team? Amen? In Jesus' name. Let's continue, y'all. Let's go ahead and close this out. So let's prove 
once again to our black conscious sisters and brothers that all these principles of doing for self, stopping black on black crime, hatred for our brothers and respect for the elderly and black economics all originated from the pages of the Holy Bible. We got about four more and then we can close it out. Let's go to Jeremiah 29. Y'all still with us? Amen. We made it, y'all. Praise God. Jeremiah 29. Let's go ahead and close this out. Jeremiah chapter 29. Let's see what the Lord told his people what to do while they were in captivity. Jeremiah 29. We're going to read 4 through 7, then we're going to skip to 28. Whenever you get it, brother, go ahead and read. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. So the Lord is the one that causes us to be put in this captivity because, again, of our disobedience. But this is what he told us to do while we was in a captivity. Verse number five. Build ye houses and dwell in them and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. In other words, be able to provide for yourself and be able to feed your family no matter what, even in captivity, sister and brothers. Go ahead. Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be, incre that ye may be increased there and not diminished. So even though you're in captivity, you can still have a family, sister and brothers. The Lord can bless you with that family. And verse number seven, definitely want y'all to highlight. Go ahead. And seek the peace of the city whither I have caused you to be carried away captives. So whatever city or country the Lord finds you in is in your best interest to seek the peace of that city. So you don't want to start tearing stuff up talking about Black Lives Matter. Because when they burn down them buildings, they're going to go somewhere else. And now you're going to be stuck in the area. You ain't got no CVS. You ain't got no Walmart. You ain't got nothing. If anything, you might catch a case if they catch you throwing a brick. So the Lord says, seek the peace of the city where I caused you to be carried away captive. Go ahead. And pray unto the Lord for it. Go ahead. For in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. So you got to be out. It's all right. You can have peaceful protest. You can exercise your right to free speech. But when they get to clowning, you just make sure you take your butt home. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Last place on this one, we're going to stay in uh, Je Jeremiah 29. And let's read verse number 28. Jeremiah chapter 29. This wasn't on there. I had to add it. Jeremiah 29 and read that verse 28. Go ahead, brother. For therefore he sent unto us in Babylon, saying, this captivity is long. So this captivity is long, and we've been in captivity, sister and brothers, really, as a whole, all of us, 70 A.D. So for the past 2,000 years or so, we've been in captivity, but that still is not an excuse to handle your business. What did the Lord tell us to do? Build ye houses. Build ye houses. And dwell in them. Go ahead. And plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. So in other words, sister and brothers, to the best of your ability, if you can, do for yourself and handle your business. So that do-for-yourself theology didn't start with Marcus Garvey and Garveyism. It didn't start with the Nation of Islam and uh, Elijah Muhammad. It started in the pages of this Holy Bible, which everybody's trying to throw away. Does that make sense? Let's go now to Leviticus chapter 19. We got four more after this, and then that's it. We'll pick it up. Leviticus chapter 19. And let's see some of these other so-called conscious or comedic or Afrocentric um, ideologies that they try to push, which ain't nothing bad about them, but again, they originated in the pages of the Holy Bible. It's the same book they're trying to get you to throw away, because that's our salvation. Leviticus chapter 19, my beloved brother. Let's read verses 9 through 10, and then we will skip. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 through 10, and then we'll skip. When you get it, brother Donnie, go ahead and read. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field. Neither shalt thou gather the, the gleanings of thy harvest. So he's saying when you go and get the harvest of your land, you leave the corners of that. Why? Verse 10. And thou shalt not glean thy vineyard. Neither shalt thou gather every grape of the vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. I am the Lord your God. And we see this in the book of Ruth, sister and brothers. When Ruth and her mother-in-law Naomi were both widows, they went to the field of Boaz. And they was able to reap the corners because that was set aside for the poor. So the Lord always had a social program for the poor, widow, and the needy, even the stranger. So again, these aren't so-called comedic principles. These are principles of the pages of the Holy Bible. Verse 16. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. So sorry, Wendy Williams, you're in the era, sister. Can't go up and down as a talebearer amongst our people, even though you make a lot of money doing it. Go ahead. 
Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Go ahead, verse number 17. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. So that's that black on black crime. You're not supposed to hate your brother in your heart. Go ahead. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. But you can rebuke him in righteousness, sister and brothers. You ain't got to put him on blast and put all his business out there on social media. Verse number uh, 30. Verse number 30. Ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. So you have to keep the Lord's weekly Sabbath, his annual Sabbath, and most importantly, you got to respect the Lord's house, sister and brothers. You don't come up in the Lord's house clowning because you don't go to your job clowning, do you? You laugh at their corny jokes. You go out to Wild Wings with them and have a beer every Tuesday, but you only in the Lord's house three hours out of the whole week, and you can't stand your brother and sister next to you. Sister and brothers, that's not right, is it? Supposed to respect the Lord's house, amen. Amen. You got quiet, brother Donnie, did it not? <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. The Lord, it says a two edged sword, it cuts everybody, does it not? That's right. 30, uh, 31. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. So we can't deal with Miss Cleo and the tarot card readers and all that stuff. The Lord says, don't deal with that madness. Go ahead, verse 34. That's 34. I'm sorry, where are we at? Uh, that was 31. Yeah, go ahead and read through, 32. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head, and honor the face of the old man, and fear thy God, I am the Lord. So we don't do that today, but we're supposed to be doing that. This is respect for the elderly, sisters and brothers. Again, these are not comedic principles. These are principles out of the pages of the Holy Bible. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, 33 and 34. If a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, ye shall not vex him. So you don't supposed to, brothers, let strangers kiss your boots thinking that you're doing something. Mm. Cause I see a video out there on social media somebody posted, and all these other Hebrews are like, that's because they, they, these brothers had a, a Gentile kiss their feet. And you had other Hebrews talking about, that's right, that's right, that's right, come Yasharala. Mm. You have this man kiss your boot, but you're going to work for him on Monday. <laughs> if you got a job. So what did you do? Nothing. <laughs> Just put up a video so people can give you a praise on social media. Read that again. I don't think they heard you, brother. Verse number 33. And if a stranger shall join with thee in your land, ye shall not vex him. You don't vex any stranger, sister and brothers. What you supposed to do? Verse 34. But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you. So if a stranger dwells among you, sister and brothers, that is not your personal servant. He's supposed to be one is born among you. Go ahead. And thou shalt love him as thyself. This is Moses writing, my brothers. That's right. You shall love the stranger as yourself. Go ahead. For ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So you don't vex anybody. If they don't look like you, they want to serve the God that you serve. That's your sister. That's your brother. Amen. Amen. You don't like that. You got a problem with the God that wrote this Bible. That's why we're in captivity to this very day. I'm thinking of a word, but I ain't going to say it. <laughs> Where we at, brother? That was the end of 34. Okay, praise God. Let's go ahead and finish this out. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians now. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Y'all still with us? Yeah. Praise God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We got three more after this, and that is it. So again, the Lord tells us how we should deal with our neighbors, how we should deal with our sisters and brothers, how we should respect the elderly, even how we're supposed to have some set aside uh, provisions for the poor but the good thing about the lord he's a righteous judge because you got some people out here too many brothers that'll take advantage of that and the lord also got something for us as well too second thessalonians chapter three and we're gonna read verses 10 through 12. second thessalonians chapter three verses 10 through 12. when you get it brother go ahead and read for even when we were with you this we command to you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Yeah, there's provisions for the poor, but if a man is able-bodied and he's healthy, he's able to do so. The book says if a man don't work, neither should he eat. Go ahead, verse number 11. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybody. I've seen too many brothers on social media ain't even got a job, but they make videos and posts each and every day. I always wanted to debate somebody. I want to debate. I want to debunk. I want to dispute. How come you don't want a, a job? <laughs> you want to debate me at two in the afternoon? I'm at work. Because mm -hmm. the book says if a man don't work, he don't eat. Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's Bible. That's book, chapter, and verse. Go ahead, verse number 12. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by the Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work 
and eat their own bread. Amen. We ain't got to interpret that. Uh, two, three more places here. Psalm chapter 82. Because, again, you got so many brothers in these movements. They're quick to say that uh, the black man is God. You got some of them saying that the black woman is God. But let's see what the Bible says, and let's read this with some understanding. We got Psalms 82. We're going to read verses 6 through 7. We got two more after this, and then we can close it out. Amen. Right on time. Psalms 82. We're going to read verses 6 through 7. And I was going to cut this, but thank y'all for not letting me cut it. <laughs> <laughs> Psalms 82, 6 through 7. When you get it, my beloved brother, go ahead and read. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. So if you want to call yourself gods... Only because you are children of the Most High and you are obedient unto him can you take that title, God's little g. Because you're not going to be transformed until the Lord returns and give us all that glorified body. That's right. Verse number seven. But ye shall die like men. So we're supposed to be gods, but because of our disobedience and our wickedness, we're going to die like the men that we are, flesh and blood. Go ahead. And fall like one of the princes. So yeah, you want to say that men are gods? Okay, whatever. But you got to be obedient to the true and living God in order to get that change. And the Lord's not going to give that to us until the first resurrection if we are so blessed. Last two scriptures. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. We want to read verses 9 and then we're going to skip to 13. 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to read verse 9. And we're going to close out at Revelation 13. 1 Peter chapter 2, my brother. 1 Peter chapter 2, let me get there. Yes, sir, let's read verse number 9. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9. Whenever you get it, brother Donnie, go ahead and read. But ye are a chosen, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Talking to the children of Israel, he says, you're a chosen generation and a royal priesthood. Go ahead. And holy nation. A holy nation of people. Go ahead. A peculiar people. That ye should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And the priests, what we're supposed to do is teach all the sons of Adam what thus said the Lord to reconcile them back into the heavenly father so we all can get this salvation. Right. Skip down, if you will, brother, to verse 13 and 14. But then, while we're on this flesh, Peter gives us some nuggets of wisdom, and I drew everybody to pay attention. Go ahead, verse 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Whether it be to the king as supreme. So in other words, obey the laws of the land. It'll make your job in life a whole lot easier. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. So the cops are there, sister and brothers, to punish those that are breaking the law. But if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, sister and brothers, you ain't got to worry about that. So make sure that you're doing everything that you're supposed to do. If you're driving out here, make sure that your license is up to date. And your tags and registration as well, too. Mm -hmm. And when they pull you over because you ain't got a license, they'll be trying to cuss nobody out. Talking about you a sovereign citizen. Right. Okay. He's going to take your sovereign behind in some sovereign handcuffs and put your sovereign behind in a sovereign jail. And you can mm -hmm. argue law left and right with the mother ghetto scholars in, a, in jail. <laughs> so to avoid all that, make sure all your ducks are in row. Amen. Last place we want to go, sister and brothers. If you don't believe nothing else that we saw in this lesson, pray that you believe this. Revelation chapter 13, we want to read verses 16 through 18. Because again, when you talk to some of these comedic Egyptian scholars, these Afrocentric scholars, whatever, they quick to tell you about what they think the mark of the beast is. But that's a biblical thing. You don't see nothing about the mark of the beast in the Egyptian book of the dead. Mm -hmm. But they even got that wrong. We got a lesson that's <clears throat> break down what the mark of the beast is. Let's see what the Bible says. This is the last scripture, Revelation 13, 16 through 18. When you get it, go ahead and read. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. So again, the mark goes in your right hand and it goes in your forehead. And we saw an example of that Ash Wednesday a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, verse 17. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the, num or, the num or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And I heard a couple of them comedics butcher this up so bad, they wanted to try to say, well, you know, the COVID uh, vaccine is the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I said, wait a minute, you got many people out here that don't have the vaccine. They buying stuff left and right. So that can't be the mark of the beast. He said, in your right hand or your forehead. And the way some of these thick brothers' heads is, you can't get nothing through that, <laughs> let alone a needle. <laughs> so how is that the mark of the beast? So again, sometimes you got to leave brothers where they're at after you rebuke them in righteousness. But let's see what the book says. This is the last scripture, verse 18. Here is wisdom. So this is wisdom. If you want wisdom, you got to get it from the word of the Lord. Go ahead. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. So if you got some understanding, you count what that number is. Go ahead. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. And again, we got other lessons, sisters and brothers, that show you exactly what that is. And we even got some literature outside that, show, that shows exactly what it is. But the reason that we went here is to show that in the Bible, we show a one world government, we show a cashless society, and we show showing people not being able to buy and sell unless they have a specific mark. So my question is, if the Bible is nothing, is no good, is plagiarized, then where is the cash of society or the mark of the beast or one world government or any of that in the Egyptian book of the dead or any Egyptian writing? If the Bible plagiarized from this, it should be in here, right? Like my brother said, it ain't in here. Unlike Prego, it's not in here, amen? Mm -hmm. So if the so-called Egyptian gods can't do nothing for you, why are you dealing with them? You should deal with the true and living God because he called the end from the beginning and that's why we know that he is a God that we should worship. He is the one that is in the business of blessing folks because he blessed us with a brand new facility right here and a beautiful choir. I thank you for your time.